I'm really excited to be introducing Paul today. It is incredibly exciting to see your students finally come out the other end. And I use the word finally in the unhappiest of terms. Paul's been with us for a wee while. He did his honors with Thies and I when we were at the Ludwig. He was the top student in his class, which was enough for Thies to decide it was all right to keep him along. He wanted to work for a little while after that, and the Ludwig was in the middle of moving into Weehai. So Thies let him work as an RA in his lab for a year, where he had the pleasure of genotyping the gazillion strains of mice that the Ernst lab has. After that, he started his PhD with Thies and I, and during that time, I moved down to the Inflammation Division. Paul moved along with me, along with Adele, so it was just the three of us for quite a long time. So Paul has survived an institute closing, a lab moving, a new lab starting. He's the only boy in my group, and there's been a number of babies that have come through the group, so he's survived a whole lot of girl talk as well. So um, what I'd like to do today is just um, introduce Paul. Because I'm not doing his questions, I want to congratulate him on four years of hard work. The first section of his talk today was submitted to Nature Medicine last week. I half expected it to be rejected this morning, because that's the kind of luck Paul's had the last few weeks in the lab. But it's still alive, and we sort of go by the um, cheesy old saying that uh, you shoot for the moon, and even if you don't get there, you'll be amongst the stars. So Paul has the opportunity to do a postdoc at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philly with Sergei Grivenkov if he wants to. At the moment, we just want to get him through his thesis and to see what he does after that. So congratulations, Paul. Take it away. OK. Um, do you mind turning off the light, the like sunlight? No, not that light, but anyway. OK, um, thanks, everyone, for coming along. Um, today, I'll be talking about the work that I've been doing as part of my PhD, looking at the role of cytokine signaling in gastric cancer. By way of introduction, for those of you that don't usually work on the stomach, here is a schematic of the stomach on the left, um, showing the stomach's three main regions, the fundus, the body, and the antrum. And so in gastric cancer, the tumors that develop are commonly observed in either the body or the antrum of the stomach. Normally, the stomach is organized into glandular structures, as shown here, where at the base of these glands are the stem cells, and in the neck of the glands are specialized epithelial cells, such as mucus-producing cells, as well as parietal cells, which can secrete gastric acid. And so these cells are involved in the defense of the stomach against invasion by pathogenic bacteria, as well as helping to break down the food that we eat. So gastric cancer is one of the most common cancers in the world, and third most common cause of cancer-related death, with over 700,000 deaths every year. In Australia, although the disease is not as common as in some other regions, such as South America and Asia, it is still quite a serious disease, with over 2,000 new cases every year and affecting twice as many men as women. Because the disease is asymptomatic for long periods of time and because there are no routine screening methods for the disease, when it is finally detected, it is usually already at an advanced stage where there are limited treatment options, and this is reflected in its poor five-year survival after diagnosis, being around 25%. So this really highlights the need for the development of more effective therapies for late-stage disease, as well as better detection methods to detect early stage disease where therapies may be more effective. So when I talk about gastric cancer, um, over 90% develop as adenocarcinomas. And of those adenocarcinomas, the two main histological types are intestinal type and diffuse type. And so for my talk today, I'll mainly be talking about intestinal type gastric cancer, or IGC for short, where the tumors that develop are well differentiated. As shown here, in these um, sequence of histological images showing the progression of IGC. One of the early steps that occurs is chronic gastritis, which can occur when someone is infected with the gram-negative bacterium Helicobacter pylori, which is, one, which is also one of the main risk factors for developing gastric cancer. This can cause damage to the gastric epithelium, as shown at the top, as well as the infiltration of inflammatory cells. Over time, this chronic inflammation leads to the loss of the specialized epithelial cells that I mentioned, such as the parietal cells in atrophic gastritis and the replacement with alternating goblet and absorbed cells in intestinal menoplasia. And so as shown here, these goblet cells are shown as the light pink circles. And then over time, this leads to dysplasia and adenocarcinoma formation. So one of the points that I want to make with this slide is that chronic inflammation, such as that occurring in chronic gastritis, is one of the main drivers for intestinal type gastric cancer progression and while I mentioned Helicobacter pylori as one of the main risk factors for developing disease, 
There are other risk factors that are also involved, such as diet high in salt, as well as genetic predispositions, such as um, polymorphisms in pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this paper by Hanahan and Weinberg suggests that there, that there were a number of characteristics that all tumors can have, known as the hallmarks of cancer. So briefly going through these, tumors have the ability to invade and spread to other organs, the ability to develop new blood vessels, genome instability, the ability to resist cell death, altered cell metabolism, the ability to proliferate, as well as evade growth suppressors, the ability to avoid destruction by the immune system, as well as being able to replicate indefinitely. So one of the newer um, hallmarks of cancer that was recently added was tumor-promoting inflammation, and this will be the focus of my talk today in the context of cytokine production. And so it um, is now well appreciated. There is a link between inflammation and gastric cancer, such as in these two studies here, where they showed that treating patients um, or giving or um, when patients took non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that had, they had a reduced risk of gastric cancer development. So putting this into a simple schematic, um, in the tumor microenvironment, there is chronic inflammation and the infiltration of inflammatory cells. These cells can produce pro-inflammatory cytokines, which can then act on the tumor to promote its growth and survival. These tumors can then act back on these inflammatory cells to sustain this cascade um, and therefore promote their growth. Downstream of cytokine signaling are a number of transcription factors, two of which shown here are STAT3 and NF-kappa-B, both of which are commonly associated with inflammation and cancer. And so for STAT3, it's also been observed to be constitutively activated in intestinal-type gastric cancer um, and is associated with poor survival. And so just shown here, um, in this immunohistochemistry, it's activated STAT3 and activated P65 as a readout for NF-kappa-B and as you can see, there is high activation of both that free and P65 in these tumors. So to study cytokine signaling in gastric cancer, we have a mouse model of the disease known as the GP130FF mouse. This mouse develops tumors in the antrum of the stomach from four weeks of age and also starts to develop tumors in the body of, body of the stomach from around 16 weeks of age. And so looking at photos of the, um, of the stomachs of these mice, what I did to take these photos was to take the stomach, cut it along its greater curvature, and then pin them out onto, sil onto silicon plates with the lumen side facing towards us. And as you can see here, first we're looking at the wild-type mice on the left, the three regions that I talked about, the fundus, or the full stomach in the mouse, the body, and the antrum. So I've collected GP130 FF mice at three time points, two months, three months, and six months, representing early, established, and late stage disease. And as you can see from these photos, the development of tumors in the antrum of the stomach of these mice, which progressively grow larger, as well as start to develop in the body of the stomach. So we can also take cross-sections of the stomachs of these mice for histological analysis, as shown here, whereby um, in this H&E stain for wild-type mice, again, seeing the three regions, the full stomach, the body, and the antrum, and taking a closer look, in the wild-type mice, they develop normal glandular structures, whereas in the GP130 FF model, they have this outgrowth in the antrum of the stomach showing the tumor. And taking a closer look at these tumors, um, you can see that they have disorganized glandular structures as well as the infiltration of immune cells. Just to talk a bit more about the um, GP130 FF mice, they have a phenylalanine knock in substitution in the GP130 receptor. And so, mice that are homozygote for this phenylalanine mutation are called GP130 FF, which I'll just refer to now as the FF mice for the rest of the talk. So these mice have a ligand-dependent hyperactivation of STAT3 as well as STAT1, which results in increased gene expression of their target genes. And so work that has previously been done has shown that, that, that the development of these tumors in these mice is dependent on STAT3. So when these FF mice were crossed to STAT3, um, crossed to mice with reduced STAT3 activation, as shown in the purple here, they had a significant reduction in tumor burden as measured by the tumor mass. Additionally, we know that pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling is involved in the development of tumors in these mice, as shown here, whereby if we reduce IL-11 signaling, they also have a significant reduction in tumor burden. So we know that other cytokines are elevated in this model, and what we wanted to explore in my project was um, whether they play a role in tumor development and progression. 
So this leads me to the aims of uh, my project. Firstly, looking at the role of R1 and R18 in gastric cancer, and the second, looking at the role of TH17 cytokines in gastric cancer. So firstly, looking at the two R1 family member um, cytokines, R1 and R18. There's some, there's some evidence to suggest that both of these cytokines are linked to gastric cancer, such as in this paper up here, showing that polymorphisms in the R1 gene locus are associated with increased R1 production as well as increased risk of H. pylori infection and gastric cancer development. And then for IL-18, it's been shown that um, in patients with gastric cancer, they have increased expression of IL-18 in the serum, as well as polymorphisms in the IL-18 gene promoter being associated with gastric cancer risk. So we want to investigate the relative contribution of both of these cytokines to disease development. And so both of these cytokines are activated by inflammasome signaling. So briefly, in the next couple of slides, I'll go through um, inflammasome signaling. Generally, inflammasome is activated through two signals. The first signal is this priming signal, whereby the recognition of bacterial products, such as lipopolysaccharide, LPS, by microbial sensors, such as toll-like receptors, leads to the recruitment of the adaptive protein MITE88, allowing for NF-kappa-B signaling to induce gene expression of inflammasome components as well as pro r one and pro r 18 The second signal is then the activation signal, where, for example, recognition of, of either pattern or damage associated molecular patterns leads to inflammasome complex formation. So the inflammasome um, forms as an oligomer, which allows for the recruitment of the inflammasome adapter protein ASC, leading to recruitment of pro-caspase 1 to this complex, which is cleaved to caspase 1, allowing for um, cleavage of pro r one and pro r 18 into the active forms to be secreted from the cell. And so previous work in the FF mice has looked at some of the components um, from signal one. And firstly, I'll be talking about these toll-like receptors. So um, in wild-type mice, as I mentioned, they don't develop tumors in the stomach at all, whereas in the FF model, they develop tumors in the antrum of stomach. So to look at the role of TLR signaling um, work that was done was to cross the FF mice to TLR2 deficient mice. And what they saw was a significant reduction in the tumor burden in these mice as measured as a significant reduction in the tumor mass in both male and female mice. Additionally, they saw um, a reduction in the growth of these tumors as measured by a significant reduction in the number of tumors that were smaller than two millimeters between two and four millimeters and larger than four millimeters in diameter compared to the FF mice as well as the same trend being observed um, in female mice as well. Then looking downstream of TLR signaling at the adapter protein MITE88, again, looking at the role that MITE88 is playing in these mice, FF mice were crossed to MITE88 deficient mice. And again, they saw a significant reduction in tumor burden as seen as a reduction in tumor mass in these mice compared to the FF mice, as well as a reduction in the growth as measured as the reduction in the number of tumors that were larger than four millimeters in these mice, suggesting that both TLR2 and MITE88 signaling were promoting tumor development in this model. Then, um, looking at signal two, in collaboration with Brendan Jenkins and his group at the Hudson Institute, we've looked at the inflammasome adaptive protein ASC. So firstly, what I did was to look at the expression of ASC in FF non-tumor and FF tumor tissue for fax isolated macrophages, leukocytes, and epithelial cells. And what I saw was that ASC was um, highly expressed in the epithelial cell population in these mice, as well as lower expression also observed in macrophages and leukocytes. Then to study the role of ASC um, in tumor development and progression in this model, the FF mice were crossed to ASC deficient mice. And what we saw was a significant reduction in tumor burden in these mice again, as measured as a significant reduction in tumor mass compared to the FF mice, as well as a reduction in the tumor onset, so a reduction in the number of tumors in these mice, as well as a reduction in the growth of the tumors, um, as measured as a reduction in the number of tumors between two and four millimeters and larger than four millimeters. And so um, this data is consistent with what was shown for the TLR2 and MITE88, MITE88 deficient mice, suggesting that ASC is promoting tumor development in this model. 
So then looking at um, downstream of the inflammasome and downstream of ASC at R1 and R18, a direct comparison of both of these cytokines had not yet been explored in gastric cancer, and so that was the aim of my PhD. So firstly, to look at the expression of these cytokines, um, I firstly looked by qPCR in wild-type non-tumor, FF non-tumor, and FF tumor tissue. And what I saw was a trend towards an increase in the expression of both R1-beta and R18 in the FF tumors compared to wild-type non-tumor. And this was supported by ELISA on tissue lysates for both of these cytokines, where I saw a similar trend towards an increase in the expression in the FF tumors compared to wild-type non-tumor. Then to look at where these cytokines might be expressed, I looked back at the um, facts isolated macrophage, leukocyte, and epithelial cell populations. And as you can see, for R1 beta, it is highly expressed in the leukocytes, with lower expression also observed in macrophages and epithelial cells. While for R18, it was highly expressed in the FF non-tumor, sorry, in the FF tumor epithelial cells, um, as well as low expression also observed in macrophages and leukocytes. To then look um, to see where these cytokines might be signaling to, I looked at their receptor expression, and what we saw was that for both R1 receptor and R18 receptor, highest expression was observed in the tumor epithelial cells in these mice, with lower expression also observed in the leukocyte cell populations. So then put it, putting this into um, a little schematic, um, this data suggested to us that R1 was mainly being expressed by leukocytes, while R18 was mainly being expressed by epithelial cells. And based on the receptor expression data, this suggested to us that both of these cytokines were signaling to the neoplastic epithelial cells in this model. So then we wanted to look at how these cytokines contributed to disease in the FF mice. So firstly, looking at the contribution of R1 signaling, what I did was to cross the FF mice to R1 receptor deficient mice. However, looking at the tumor onset in these mice as, as a tumor number per mouse, you can see that in the R1 receptor deficient mice, there was no significant difference in the tumor number at either three months or six months of age, representing established or late stage um, disease compared to the FF mice. However, looking at the size of the tumors in these mice, we saw a significant reduction in the number of tumors larger than four millimeters in these mice compared to the FF mice. However, looking at the tumor burden as measured by the tumor weight, we saw that there was no significant difference in the R1 receptor deficient mice compared to the FF mice. Suggesting to us that the loss of R1 signaling while having a slight um, delay in tumor growth was overall not significantly affecting tumor burden. Then to look at the role of R18 in this model, again, I've crossed the FF mice to R18 deficient mice. And so for these mice, I collected them at two months, three months, and six months of age, representing early, established, and late stage disease. So firstly, looking at the tumor number in these mice, I saw that there was no significant difference in the R18 deficient mice shown in blue compared to the FF mice shown in gray at these time points. However, again, I saw a significant reduction in the growth of these tumors, so a, a reduction in the number of tumors larger than four millimeters in the R18 deficient mice compared to the FF mice at six months of age, which corresponded with a significant reduction in tumor burden in these mice compared to the FF mice, as well as a trend towards a reduction at three months of age. And so what this R18 data suggests is that the loss of R18 signaling um, significantly reduces tumor growth as well as tumor burden. And taken together with the R1 data suggests that R18 might be having a dominant role over R1 signaling in this model. So next, we want to look at the role, um, or we want to investigate how the loss of R18 signaling was resulting in a reduction in tumor burden. So coming back to these hallmarks of cancer, the first thing I looked at was inflammation. So coming back to these cross sections of the stomachs, all these mice, just to remind you, in wild-type mice, they have normal glandular structures, whereas in the FF mice, they have disorganized glandular structures and um, the infiltration of immune cells. So looking at histological cross-sections of R18 deficient and R1 receptor deficient mice, we could, also this, we could also see this outgrowth representing the tumors in these mice, as well as disorganized glandular structures and, and the infiltration of um, immune cells. 
So while on the surface it appeared that um, there was no difference in the histology between these mice compared to the FF mice, as this model is an inflammation-driven model, we next want to quantify the inflammation in these mice. So what I did was to take cross-sections of the antrum and the body of the stomach, and then I divided it into four regions, outer glands, glands, submucosa, and muscle, as shown here along the x-axis, and then scored the inflammation that I saw on a scale from zero to three, where three was severe inflammation and zero was no inflammation. And so what I saw for the R1 receptor deficient mice was a significant reduction in the inflammation in the outer glands and glands in the antrum of the stomachs at three months of age, while in the body of the stomach at six months of age, as well, a significant reduction in the outer gland and glands. Then, looking at the inflammation in the R18 deficient mice, shown in the blue bars here, I saw that there was no significant um, difference in the inflammation in any of the four regions in either the antrum or the body of the stomach at three months of age, as well as no difference in either the antrum or the body of the stomach at six months of age. And so this suggested to us um, a couple of things. Firstly, that loss of R1 signaling, while not having a role on tumor burden in this model, appeared to affect gastric inflammation, while for R18, the loss of R18 signaling was having a role in reducing tumor burden, but didn't appear to affect gastric inflammation. So um, while, there, while it appeared that there was no change in overall inflammation in these mice, to take a closer look at the different um, immune cell populations that were present, we did immune histochemistry. Firstly, for the leukocyte marker CD45 on wild type FF and R18 deficient mice. And as you can see, um, the brown staining shows areas of CD45 positive cells with the arrows pointing towards these. And we can quantify the number of C45 positive cells per area of tissue, as shown here. However, we saw no significant difference in the number of um, positive cells in the R18 deficient mice, shown in blue, compared to the FF mice, shown in gray, in either the antrum or the body of the stomach at either three months or six months of age, suggesting to us that the loss of R18 signaling doesn't affect leukocyte numbers in this model. And this is consistent with what's also been observed in the AS deficient mice where there was no change in the CD45 numbers as well. Then, as macrophages had been shown to um, promote tumor development in this model and in gastric cancer, we next looked at the macrophage marker F480. And again, by immunist chemistry, the areas of positive brown staining um, are areas of F480 positive cells. And then quantifying this, we saw a significant reduction in the number of F480 positive cells in the antrum of the F of the FFR18 deficient mice compared to the FF mice at three months of age, as well as a trend towards a reduction in the body of the stomach. However, looking at six months of age, there appeared to be no difference um, between these two genotypes, suggesting to us that the loss of R18 signaling appeared to reduce macrophage numbers during established disease um, in this model. And this was supported by um, qPCR analysis for a couple of macrophage associated genes in this case, interferon gamma and TGF beta, where we saw a significant reduction in interferon gamma expression in both the tumor and non tumor tissue of the R18 deficient mice compared to the FF mice, as well as a reduction in TGF beta expression in the tumors of these mice. And this is consistent with what's been observed um, as reduced interferon gamma expression is seen in R18 deficient mice in the colon during inflammatory disease. So next, um, looking at cell proliferation, again by immunohistochemistry, this time for the marker PCNA, which marks proliferating cells. The brown saying shows areas of um, these proliferating cells, which we could then quantify. However, we saw no significant difference in the number of these cells in the R18 deficient mice compared to the FF mice in either the antrum or the body of the stomach at three months or six months of age. And this is supported by qPCR analysis for the proliferative gene cyclone D1, where we saw no difference in either the tumor or non-tumor tissue of the R18 deficient mice compared to the FF mice, as well as breast and blot analysis um, for cyclone D1 on tumor and non-tumor tissue, as shown here, suggesting to us that the loss of R18 signaling doesn't appear to affect cell proliferation in this model. So then how does this relate to human disease? Uh, we looked at 
the expression of both IL-1, beta and IL-18 in tissue lysates of IGC patients in tumour and non-tumour tissue. And what we saw was an increase in expression of these cytokines in the tumour tissue. And this is consistent with what was observed um, for the expression of these cytokines in the FF mouse model. So then thinking about how this relates to human disease, at the moment for IL-18, there are currently um, three therapeutic agents in the clinic or in clinical trials, two of which are IL-18 um, inhibitors. This one here, which is being developed by GSK, is a neutralizing IL-18 monoclonal, monoclonal antibody that is being trialed for um, type 2 diabetes. Well, this one is a recombinant form of IL-18 binding protein, which um, acts to inhibit IL-18 signaling that's being trialed for adult onset Stills disease. And so at the moment, um, there are currently few other inflammasome component inhibitors that are being trialed in the clinic. So, um, and also because intracellular targeting can prove to be, um, can prove to be difficult, um, cytokine targeting may prove to be an attractive therapeutic target, whereby it may be possible in the future to repurpose these inhibitors for their use in gastric cancer, um, potentially as adjuvant therapies in combination with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So just to summarize the first part of this talk, um, what I've shown is in previous work, um, TLR2 and MIT-88 have been shown to promote tumor development in the FF mice. Well, work in collaboration with Brendan Jenkins and his group has shown that the inflammasome adapter protein ASK can also promote tumor development. While my work during my PhD, um, looking at the relative contribution of IL-1 and IL-18, suggests that IL-18 may have a dominant role of IL-1 in tumor regression in this model. And so future work, um, we then did, uh, we then done to look at which inflammasome um, may be promoting tumor development and progression in these mice. So then moving away from the IL-1, IL-18 story, um, the second part of my talk will be looking at the role of TH17 cytokines in intestinal gastric cancer. And so there's some evidence to suggest that TH17 cells are present in these patients, such as in this study shown here on the left, whereby fax analysis for CD4 positive R17 positive cells, so TH17 cells in gastric cancer patients and healthy controls, found that um, these cells were increased in gastric cancer patients, as well as correlating with gastric cancer stage, as late stage patients had increased expression of these cells compared to early stage patients. Additionally, one of the cytokines that can be produced by TH17 cells is R17. And in this study here, they found that patients with high serum expression of, of IL-17 had reduced overall survival compared to those with low IL-17. So um, briefly to talk about the development of TH17 cells, um, the recognition of pathogenic bacteria by um, antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, as well as macrophages, in the presence of various cytokines, in this case R6, TGF-beta, and R23, can drive the differentiation of CD4 T cells into TH17 cells. And this process is dependent on the, trans on the um, expression of transcription factors such as STAT3 and raw gamma T. And so these effective TH17 cells can produce a number of cytokines, the two of which, which I'll be talking about, are R17 and R22. Additionally, um, raw gamma T can also, or is also involved in the development of this um, innate lymphoid cell subset known as RC freeze. And so these cells can also produce R17 and R22 as well. So firstly, looking at the role that R17 and R23 play in these mice, again, coming back to these fax isolated macrophages, leukocytes and epithelial cells, looking at the expression of R17A and its closely, re closely related member R17F, you can see that both of these cytokines are highly expressed in leukocyte cell population then looking at R23, it is secreted as a heterodimer consisting of R23A and R12B. It is also highly expressed in leukocyte cell population with lower expression also observed in macrophages and epithelial cells. And so then looking at where these cytokines might be signaling to, looking at their receptor expression, for R17 receptor, it is highly expressed in both the macrophages and leukocytes with low expression observed in epithelial cells, while for R23 receptor, it is high expressed by leukocytes um, as well as low expression observed in epithelial cells. And so what this expression does suggest 
is that um, R17 and R23 may be produced by leukocytes and also have the ability to signal to these epithelial cells in these mice. However, based on the receptor expression data, this suggested to us that R17 was mainly signaling to macrophages and other leukocytes. Well, similarly for R23, it was also signaling to leukocytes. And so to look at the contribution of the two cytokines um, to tumor development and progression, what I did was to cross the FF mice to mice that were deficient for R17 or R23 and collected them at two months, three months, and six months, representing early established and late stage disease. Um, and looking at the tumor number in these mice, I see that there was, I saw that there was a significant reduction in tumor number in the R17 deficient mice, shown in the red, compared to the FF mice. However, for R23, the loss of R23 signaling didn't appear to significantly um, alter the tumor number. Then looking at the tumor growth in these mice, again, looking at the size of the tumors, I saw that there was a reduction in the number of tumors larger than four millimeters in the R17 deficient mice compared to the FF mice. However, for the R23 deficient mice, there was no change um, in the tumor number, uh, in the size of the tumors. And then finally, looking at the tumor burden in these mice um, for R17, I saw that there was no difference in the tumor weights of these mice at either two months or three months. Um, and I don't have any data at six months because I had collected these mice for histolo histological analysis. While for R23, I saw, again, there was no significant difference in the tumor burden in these mice compared to the FF mice. So what this suggested to us was that the loss of R17 signaling um, was having a role in delaying the tumor growth, as shown here, as a reduction in the number of tumors larger than four millimeters. While for R23 signaling, this appeared to be dispensable for disease development. Then looking at the role of R22 in these mice, again, looking at the expression of R22 in these facts isolated cell populations, we saw that it was um, highly expressed in the leukocyte cells. And then looking at where it might be signaling to, the receptor expression for these cytokines, Firstly, R22 um, associates with R22 receptor, and this allows for R10 receptor beta to come in to form this heterodimeric complex. And so for R10 receptor, it was highly expressed in leukocytes with low expression also observed in macrophages and epithelial cells, while for the R22 receptor, it was exclusively expressed in the epithelial cells. And so this data is consistent with other studies that I've shown that R22 is only produced by immune cells, in this case, the leukocytes, while um, I can only signal to non-immune cell populations, in this case, the epithelial cells. And so adding on to this schematic, it shows, um, suggests that while R22 is produced by leukocytes, in contrast to R17 and R23, it exclusively signals to epithelial cells. So to look at the contribution of R22 signaling to tumor development and progression, I crossed the FF mice to mice deficient for R22, as well as the R22 receptor, and then collected them at two months and three months of age, representing early and established disease. And so looking at these mice, firstly the tumor number, I saw that there was no difference in the number of tumors in the R22 deficient mice, shown in red, compared to the, um, as well as no difference in the R22 receptor deficient mice, shown in orange, compared to the FF mice. No change in the growth of these tumors, as there was no change um, in the number of tumors at any of these sizes. However, what was surprising was that I saw a significant increase in the tumor burden as measured by the tumor weight in the R22 receptor deficient mice compared to, the, compared to the FF mice at two months of age, suggesting to us that R22 signaling um, is protecting from early, from early stage tumor development as its loss resulted in an increase in tumor burden. Then finally, looking at um, the transcription factor, raw gamma T. So just to remind you, raw gamma T is involved in the differentiation of both TS17 and RC freeze. Crossing these mice to raw gamma T deficient mice, I saw that there was no significant difference in the tumor number in these mice compared to FF mice. No difference in the growth of these tumors, as well as no difference in the tumor burden, suggesting to us that the phenotype that we saw in the IL-22 receptor deficient mice was not dependent on raw gamma T. So then looking at how this relates to human disease, I did qPCR 
on um, a DQPCR for R23, R17, and R22, on a cohort of ITC patients on non-tumor and tumor tissue. And what I saw was a significant increase in the expression of R23 in the tumors of these patients compared to non-tumor tissue. However, no difference for R17 or R22, which is also not significant when I separated these out based on H. pylori status. And so taken with the mouse data suggested to us that, um, that these cytokines, the targeting these cytokines may not be um, appropriate targets for advanced stage disease. So then summarizing the second part of this talk, um, what I showed was that R17A, R23, and R22 signaling um, signal to different cell types in the FF mice, with R17 and R23 mainly signaling to leukocytes, whereas R22 mainly to epithelial cells. In the first part, I showed that the loss of R17 signaling delays tumor growth, but doesn't affect tumor burden, whereas R23 signaling appeared to be dispensable for tumor development in this model. And then in the second part, um, I found that R22 signaling may protect against early stage tumor development with the loss of R22 signaling resulting in, in an increase in tumor burden. So then um, as an overall summary for this talk, what I showed, what, what I talked about was um, intestinal type gastric cancer is associated with inflammation and the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. In the first part, looking at the component of the inflammasome ASC, uh, we showed that, there was, that it was associated with tumor regression in this model. And then my work looking at the relative contribution of R1 and R18 suggests that R18 might be having a dominant role of R1 signaling in these mice. And then in the second part, uh, we saw that the loss of R17 reduced tumor number and size but didn't appear to affect tumor weight, while R22 signaling may be having a role in early stage tumor development. Um, with this final message suggesting that different cytokines, these different cytokines are affecting tumor regression at different stages of tumor development. And so finally, seeing, um, to put my data in the context of other gastrointestinal cancers um, shown here for R1 and R18, in the colon, it's been shown for R1 that it doesn't appear to have a significant role in tumor development. Whereas in the stomach, in a different gastric cancer model, um, overexpression of R1 appears to promote tumor progression, which is not seen in my, in my model. Whereas for R18, um, in the colon, it was found to protect from tumor development, and this was dependent on the inflammasome NLRP3. Whereas in my model, I saw the exact, the exact opposite, where it promoted tumor progression. And then for the TH17 cytokines, um, R17 was shown to promote tumor development in the colon as um, inhibition of R17 signaling resulted in a reduction in tumor number. And this is similar to what I saw in the stomachs of my mice. For R23, it also was suggested to have a role in promoting tumor development, whereas in, whereas in the FF model, it was shown to have no um, role in tumor development. And then for R22 in the colon, it's been suggested to have a dual role where early on it protects from tumor development, where later on, whereas later on it may promote disease um, and this is, a, this is um, similar to what I saw in the stomach, where at least early on, I saw that R22 signaling may protect from disease development. And so um, the other message that I wanted to get across was that it appears that these cytokines also are having unique roles in different regions of the gastrointestinal tract. So it just remains to thank um, these people in the slide. Firstly, my supervisors, Tracy and Teese for all their help and support over the last um, six or so years. Thank you for taking me on to do honors and keeping me on to do, um, to do my PhD with you for this interesting project. My PhD committee members, Ian, John, and Lisa, for all their help and support. Members of the lab, Lada, Ashley, Adele, and Seward, for helping me out with collecting mice and experiments when I needed help. As well as new additions to the lab, Kayi, Kahina, Akshay, and Christy, as well as past members of the lab, um, the inflammation division, it's been great to work with you guys, um, and as well as great to borrow reagents off of you. <laughs> um, as well as, as the CSCD division, where I was there for the first year of my PhD. Um, I'd like to thank as well the Ernst Lab, who have now moved out the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute. 
um, and our collaborators within Lehigh, within uh, in molecular immunology, Gabrielle, Lisa, and Angela, who are collaborating with for the um, TH17 story. In MDC, Lorraine and Anne for helping me out with some of my fact source. And collaborators at the Peter Mac, Rita and Alex for um, kindly providing human samples to do analysis on. Laurie and John Christophe for the IL-22 deficient and IL-22 receptor deficient mice. And from the Hudson Institute, Brendan, Virginia and Alison who are collaborating with for the IL-18 and ASK and ask story. And then finally, um, the animal facility, fax facility, histology and imaging, as well as C cell genetic and Pfizer for various reagents, um, the APA for my scholarship, as well as um, cancer therapeutics for a travel scholarship. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So um, Tracy and I decided that Tracy would do the difficult part, look after Paul and introduce him. I do the, the easy part, just um, coordinate the question. But before we do that, I, I'd like to thank Paul. I think it was a fantastic talk, um, a very thorough analysis. And um, I guess due to um, Davos' insistence that we should show individual data points rather than histograms, <coughs> that was just fantastic, um, the way you showed the result for each and every mouse. So are there any questions for Paul? Yeah. Paul, well, I wonder if the um, relative contribution of R1 and R18, whether you looked at if either of those cytokines went up in those six school knockouts, is there a compensation there for double knockouts for the US? Yeah, so at least in the I18 deficient mice, I looked at R1 beta, um, and it didn't appear to be um, significantly upregulated. I haven't looked at um, the other ones yet, but yeah, that's something worth looking at. The data that you showed on the human tumor samples, yep. um, so at the end of the IL-18 IL part of the talk. Yep. So it, it looks like the, um, the increased IL-18 year expression you're seeing there is really down to just a couple or a handful of samples. Yep. So um, are the data points on that graph all, is each one an individual patient, or are there multiple biopsies per patient? No, so each point is an individual patient. Yeah, so, the, so do those data suggest that if there is an effect there that's worth targeting for an uh, anti-cytokine therapy, that, that that biopsy really needs to be a screening point to stratify patients to identify the few that would benefit? Yeah, so that's something that, um, that should be considered because, at least from my mass data, um, it, su it suggested that IT might be having a role in later stage disease, so it might be worth targeting during later stage disease. And... Yeah, based on that, um, I think I'll go back and stratify that based on tumor stage just to see if there, there is a difference, if something comes out there as well. So we have, that, um, we have the patient info, so we can do that. Um, so the main driving force for tumor development in this model yep. is the ligand-dependent um, activation of the GP1. And I think the understanding is that the IL-11 cytokine is by far the most important yep. um, ligand to activate that cascade. So you didn't really put your results with these other cytokines um, in, contact, uh, in context of what the IL-11 does in the context of the information. Can you? Yep, sure. Yep, so um, in the IL-18 deficient mice, I looked at, or I looked at a couple of things. Firstly, look, I looked at the expression of R11, um, which, as you said, is one of the main drivers for de tumor development. I didn't see a change in R11 expression in these mice. Downstream of R11 is obviously STAT-free, or downstream of R11 is STAT-free activation. I looked at STAT-free image chemistry and Western blot, as well as a number of STAT-free target genes. So besides from R11, SOX3, um, VEGF, and some of the other genes. And I saw no significant difference there either. So possibly the role that R18 is having in this model is STAT-free independent. Um, and I mean, from Stefan's data, so if on the mTOR mice, like he also showed that that was, you know, dependent on mTOR and not STAT-free. So that's sort of, sort of parallels what he showed. Well, I guess what I was getting at was with the, um, 
final slides where you summarized your results against um, results that were done with individual knockouts of some of those cytokines yeah. or those receptors. Um, you highlighted that there were some quite distinct differences between yeah. your data and let's say, I um, can't remember which one, but maybe IL-23 is <coughs> blockade. Yeah. Um, is, that's not really surprising, is it, in the context where there's no IL-11-driven um, tumor development? Um, sorry. So, so your model, the FF model, is set up to analyze the role of STAT-3 activation in response to IL-11. In the other models, that's not a component of the tumor growth. They're, they're individual. Sure, yeah, I see what you're saying. But um, so, yes, while this model is exquisitely dependent on R11 is step free. Uh, from my data, it suggests that, I mean, and, and in human disease, like, it's not just R11, there are other cytokines. Although, I'll tell you a point, that is possibly, well, that is one limitation to the model, is that it is more dependent on step free than maybe, than maybe in human disease, but. I don't jump in there, John, I completely disagree, because all the coli models here is contrasting to, we've also shown are exquisitely dependent on R11, even though they may not have that GPM. So while R11 is driving disease and hyperplasia, there are many other things that we don't understand yet in those models. Just to help you with your brain. Paul, can I ask you a question? So we have um, shown quite compellingly that at least in this model, um, these cytokines are largely dispensable for the growth of adenomas, but obviously adenomas don't kill the patients. Yeah. So what, what do we know about these cytokines in the context of metastatic disease? Um, so, for R18, um, it's been shown in one study that it may, or in one study for gastric cancer, that it may be, it may um, upregulate the expression of um, angiogenic factors, so VEGF and CD40, that may be involved in met metastasis to other organs. Um, IL22 is associated with um, colon cancer stemness, so that might be also be involved in the spread. Um, to all the organs as well. Um, for all 17, all 23, just thinking, can't remember off the top of my head. Please. Any other questions? If not, then let's uh, join in and say, oh, thank you.